You are hiking in the Jura Mountains on a beautiful summer day. The sky clear, the air warm. Doesn't that sound nice right about now? You're among friends and talking as you go about the past week, about your drive to the mountains, about what you're going to make for dinner when you go back home. A couple hours pass easily like this, walking along unhurriedly, putting one foot in front of the other, passing one meadow and then another. You stop for a snack and then you start walking again until a sinking feeling stops you in your tracks and you realize you've left the path behind without noticing it. There are tall trees in every direction and it's not clear which way leads to the pass that you were aiming for. You look around for something familiar, but to no avail. Somehow, you've lost your way. Hey, where are we? You ask. It's easy to get lost if you don't pay attention to where you're going. And writer Stephanie Paulsell says that is just what the season of Advent is about. Advent trains us to keep our eyes on the horizon, she says and let what we see in the distance shape how we respond to what we see up close. That takes practice, she adds. I really like that way of speaking about Advent. In these weeks leading up to Christmas, we hear the prophets telling us to lift our eyes, to stop looking only at our shoes, and to pay attention to what is there on God's horizon. And what do they show us there at the place where Earth and heaven meet. They show us people finished with war for good. They show us a creation filled with life and contentment and mutuality. They show us a world dancing with justice and with joy. See that? They say, far off in the distance. That's where we are headed. Just keep your eyes there, put one foot in front of the other, and you'll be fine. Easier said than done. You and I both know that. It takes practice to keep that horizon in view and to walk toward it with purpose. Somehow that feels especially difficult today, I think, because sometimes the trees can get awfully tall and the canopy awfully dense. Sometimes the distractions can get awfully loud and sometimes the clouds roll in thick as mud. It takes practice to keep your wits about you and to keep walking toward the horizon even then. All that is another way of talking about God's vision, which we've been speaking and praying about through these weeks of Advent this year. The prophet Isaiah has been our guide through the season, pointing to that sweeping vista of God's horizon, a vision of the world restored and whole and at peace. We've been training our eyes to see that over these past weeks in the middle of the tall trees of violence and fear that keep growing up around. We have been straining to glimpse God's vision. So how do we keep moving toward it? To help with that question this morning, we have Joseph with us. He might seem like an unlikely conversation partner for this job. I mean, he's not a prophet or a king or a particularly high profile sort of guy. But there is something right about Joseph helping to answer the question of how we move toward God's vision because he's a person of action. Isaiah and John the Baptist have plenty to say about it, that's for sure. These are folks with words rolling easily off their tongues. Joseph, by contrast, is not so much of a talker. In fact, the Bible doesn't record a single word he said. We only know about what he did. And what he did, of course, is to adopt the infant Jesus, and along with Mary, raise him as his own son. He took quite a step toward God's horizon, and he had some pretty significant trees in his way. The way Matthew tells it, Joseph and Mary were engaged to be married. Wedding plans would have been underway. The small community of Nazareth would have been preparing for the celebration. Joseph would have been making plans about where he and his new family would live. And in the discreet language of the Bible, Mary was found to be with child. I've always admired Joseph at this point in the story. I mean, his culture doesn't give him a whole lot of options for what to do here. 
There weren't couples counseling centers in Nazareth where he and Mary could make an appointment and try to work this out. He was basically left with the law's instruction to call off the marriage. His only real choice was whether to do that in a big public way or whether to do it quietly. And I think it's pretty clear he chose the more honorable way to go. So then comes the angel speaking to him. And I think I've always thought that Joseph's heroics basically end here. I mean, up to this point, he didn't have any help in knowing what to do with this challenging situation. He was on his own. But now he's got an angel talking to him, telling him what to do. Now he's got divine guidance, so of course he knew how to proceed after that. But the angel came to him in a dream, Matthew says. And you and I both know that dreams are tricky business. I mean, I imagine Joseph had lots of other dreams, too. He probably had dreams about messing up some carpentry project for an important customer, and dreams about the house he would like to build for his new family, and dreams about the person who said something nasty to him in the marketplace last week. And then one night, when he had just made the decision to settle things quietly with Mary, he had a dream where an angel spoke to him and told him this baby was God's baby. And he shouldn't worry, everything would be fine. This child would save the world from their sins. So what do you do about that? I mean, we tend to assume that everything is clear when the Bible says someone had a dream with an angel in it. Like, of course that settles the issue. If you look at artwork depicting this scene, you often find this very large angel with huge wings speaking right to Joseph, making this very clear. But I kind of prefer that image that's on the cover of your bulletin with that mysterious, shapeless face whispering in Joseph's ear. Because I'm not sure it would have been all that clear. I mean, that dream might have been striking and memorable at the time, but it was still a dream. And dreams can seem real for a moment, but they are gone in the light of day. So what is Joseph supposed to do when he wakes up the next morning? The dream is gone, but Mary's belly is still growing, and the people are all starting to notice it as the wedding day approaches. What's he supposed to do? What's he supposed to say? Don't worry, folks. This is the Holy Spirit's baby, and he's going to save everybody. I know it because I had this really vivid dream. In the words of our shepherd from last Sunday's pageant, heavy. Right? <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> We don't know what Joseph said, but we know what he did. He glimpsed God's vision that this baby was going to change the world, and he kept that horizon in front of him and took a step, risking the taunts of his neighbors and the doubts in his own mind. I want to tell you about another couple taking a risk today. Hassan and Rayan are Syrians who, like many, fled the violence and instability in their home country recently. They ended up in a small, informal refugee settlement outside Izmir, Turkey, where they have found work in the nearby agricultural fields. They work long hours for little pay. But at the end of every day, this couple in their late teens, something like 18 years old, they set up a makeshift outdoor classroom at the edge of the fields and teach reading and math to the 26 children who are living with them in the refugee settlement. A recent visitor described the scene this way. I was moved to tears watching the teachers and the children, as young as six, trudge back from the field, only to douse themselves in water from the camp tap, grab their newly donated pencil and notepad, and run to the classroom under a tree. From workers, they transformed into children again, eager to learn and beaming with satisfaction at getting an answer correct. Our congregation is supporting this small project through our sharing fund this year, and I hope you can see why. I stand in awe of these teachers, taking the risk of giving these kids hope and some semblance of normalcy in the middle of their uprooted lives. Hassan and Rayan have glimpsed something beautiful on the horizon, a future for these 26 children, a life beyond their precarious existence, and they are taking steps to walk toward it. This is amazing, isn't it? That is what can happen 
when you have the horizon in view. I don't know where you have glimpsed God's vision. Maybe the words of the prophet Isaiah have nudged their way into your heart in these past weeks. Maybe you have looked around the room here on an ordinary Sunday morning and seen something extraordinary at this communion table. People from all walks of life standing there ready to receive where everyone is fed and no one goes away hungry. Maybe you have watched a young mother caring patiently for her child and seen something of the way God cares for each of us. Maybe you have had a dream like Joseph. Wherever you have glimpsed God's vision, honor it and cherish it for the precious, precious thing that it is. You might choose a symbol this morning to remind you, something to nudge you to lift your eyes when you are feeling deep in the thick of doubt or fear and to look to that horizon where God imagines peace so full that nothing is left beyond it. Something to remind you to take a step. Because it's easy to get lost if you don't pay attention to where you are going. But friends, the horizon is there to guide us. Just remember the prophets pointing us there. Just remember Joseph waking up that morning with a dream he couldn't shake, a vision that he knew was worth the risk. Amen.